wonderful for me to be here. If you're expecting me to give a critical talk, I'm really sorry, you can leave now. And you will have heard that I've been on board with the Hanks program since the very beginning. It was a huge privilege for me uh, to be in that situation. So uh, you're not going to hear any critique. No patricide here, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, in fact, I mean, I feel so reminded, you know, just a to bring back a little bit of history into the room, Hazok was actually the person who alerted me to the PhD position that was opening in Hans Group, working on understanding in 2002, which is where I then ended up. So I'm very grateful for, for that opportunity. And so one thing I hope that my comments will bring up is just how generative Hanks work has been on understanding. I really do think that it's made a difference in philosophy and science by opening up a whole field how to think differently about, for instance, what I'm very interested in, which is embodied knowledge, how to think about, indeed, again, from a different perspective, like about the role of models, for instance, in science, how to think about the role of agents when we're thinking about knowledge. And that's what, for me, has always been really, really wonderful, but I think that's also what made this work very important in very different parts of philosophy, and in fact, I mean, it's been picked up by so many people. So what I'm going to do today is to pick up on work that, in fact, I started when I was a PhD student in, in Hex Group, which was um, on model organisms. This is work that now, for quite a number of years, I've been developing together with Rachel Ankeny from the University of Adelaide. So this talk is absolutely core to the work. And um, so I want to touch on the question of, you know, what does it mean to consider as a model something which is embodied, a material model, a model organism, which in biology is one of the most important models we have. And how do we think about representational claims in terms of those models? Specifically, what do we mean when we say that these models are plausible? It is an important question because many of these models are actually completely implausible. For instance, we work on uh, the use of rodents for studying um, alcoholic addiction and other forms of addiction. Rodents don't get addicted to alcohol. So, you know, you, do, you couldn't get a more implausible model. And yet, this is the key model on which 95% of the more molecularly based research done on uh, things like um, alcoholic dependence is actually done. Right? So, what is happening in these situations? And um, I will use that as an entry to talk about the work that I've been doing with Rachel on repertoires. And through that, I hope to illustrate really, you know, and kind of give a bit more flesh to a part of the account of Hank's account, which we haven't really touched on yet, which is indeed the role of agents and research communities um, in acquiring understanding and performing skills, and come to this idea of the role of performative and social skills for scientific understanding. So I also want to say something before starting on methods. And this is because I think it's also very important to see work such as Hank's that really is exemplifying a particular approach in philosophy of science that we're calling philosophy of science in practice. Many people in this room are kind of um, founding mothers and fathers of this approach, and uh, we've seen that exemplified in a lot of work. And certainly, the work that me and Rachel are uh, performing is absolutely within this approach. And I think um, one of the nice ways of thinking about this, which is um, explained in Hank's book, where he also refers to Hans Rudder, who has been uh, working on these things also in Amsterdam. Like this idea that we are looking for a framework that elucidates non-local patterns. And we're doing that by actually intertwining in-depth studies, very often qualitative studies, of particular uh, cases, and um, very often historical, uh, from scientific research, with um, the analysis of philosophical issues that this uh, research actually brings up. So our account, like X, it intertwines descriptive and normative analysis of scientific practices. And what is really critical to what I'm going to be saying is, I mean, the, really that the focus of our work is we're looking at how understanding model organisms, uh, understanding how model organisms as scientific models informs the scientific understanding of life, involves trying to understand how scientists actually use them, and how those uses and associated arguments have changed over time. And that's what I'm going to be uh, trying to uh, think about um, here a bit. So these are just a few examples of the most canonical, canonical model organisms in biological research. The risk of changing, but this is the one that sort of, you know, the, the really the most standard examples. And um, so they go from, you know, uh, Drosophila to the fruit fly. You will probably all be aware of this. This was absolutely foundational <coughs> in a foundational model organism, particularly for genetic studies. Um, Zebrafish, um, of course, mouse and rats and things like this. So we define model organisms as non-human species that are extensively studied in order to understand the whole range of biological phenomena. This is very important, but the range is very broad. 
with the hope that the data and the theories generated through the use of this model will be applicable to other organisms, and specifically that they will be applicable to organisms which are more complex than the organism that actually is being studied. So, as how do we think about model organisms as models? Well, um, first of all, that we really want to define them as key components of that distinctive, full way of doing research uh, within biology. They do help to create knowledge that can be projected beyond its immediate domain. We analyze this projection in terms of uh, two concepts. First of all, the, the idea of the range of organisms that actually is being represented, whether it's just one particular population, whether it's a whole species, whether it's several species, whether it's a whole genus. We call this the representational scope of the model. We also want to think about the target of phenomena, the target phenomena, if you want, uh, that uh, model organisms are used to study. So how many phenomena they used to study, we call this the representational target. Uh, now, what we want to say is that the, the distinctiveness of model organisms, and actually what makes a difference, for instance, from other types of organisms used as models in biology, other types of experimental organisms, stems from the simultaneous attribution to these models of a wide representational scope and a wide representational target. So these are meant to stand for lots of different types of organisms and also lots of different types of phenomena, all at the same time. And of course, there's a whole set of questions we can raise about, you know, high quality raise it, about whether these are artifacts or not. I mean, I think this will come up quite clearly for the rest of my talk. So now, shift of um, scene, we bring in another side of the room. And one of the things that we found quite useful uh, in the last few years in thinking about how do we think about representation in, in model organisms is the DECI scheme uh, that Roman and James have produced. So it's great to have both uh, the authors here also. So, I mean, I'm not going to try and explain in any comprehensive way all the ins and outs of this model, uh, but just to say the idea here generally, and correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, <laughs> is that you have a model that denotes a particular target, and it does that by virtue of actually being exemplified through particular properties of this model, which are taken to be, they're assumed to be, um, plausibly assumed to be, um, corresponding to properties which are imputed to the target. So, and what I'm particularly interested in when thinking about the DACI model here is this relationship, and specifically this key. What makes plausible that we attribute, that we basically um, you know, compare meaningfully properties that we attribute to the model with properties that we actually attribute to the target. So, if we think about this scheme in relation to how model organisms are present, then there's a few things that we would like to say. So, we would like to say, first of all, that what we really think about as the model is the specific specimens, if you want, the tokens that are actually doing um, the representing work here. So, we think about a set of specimens, lots of different mice, lots of different plants, lots of different worms, uh, which display broadly similar phenotypic properties, and this actually constitutes a material object that functions as a model. The crucial assumption we're interested in is how do we think that the selected property of the object represents properties of the assumed target, which are exemplified by the properties of the model. So the object uh, that we're thinking about here is interpreted as a type of representation for the intended target. And in the specific case we're interested in, the standardized specimens are, is an, if you want, a, a, a representation of something which is, you can regard as a whole and many other organisms like representation, to take that terminology that uh, Roman and James have uh, presented. So researchers impute these properties to the target, and this is what solidifies the representational relationship between the model and the target here. So sorry, just to exemplify this, uh, maybe mm -hmm. slightly. Uh, difficult thing to follow in the abstract. So what we have here as a model is standardized specimens which are taken to be representations of whole and other organisms, so that this dual uh, set of properties. They exemplify the particular properties of the specimens, which are, for instance, the fact that they have particular genetic pathways, they have certain kind of environmental traits, and so on and so forth. These properties are taken to actually be very often the same or anyhow, very, very strongly comparable with the properties they want to attribute to the target, which will be, again, genetic pathways, developmental traits, et cetera, et cetera, and the target would be the you know, whole organism, like so the organism taken as a sort of you want, holistic whole, not kind of in little modules, and other organisms. And what makes it possible 
to think that these properties could be taken to be the same, or something very close to the same properties, are uh, what um, Jensen uh, Roman called the key, which we take to be, in the first instance, things like you know principles, like the principle of conservation, genetic conservation, you assume the fact that certain genes are conserved across species for evolutionary reasons, and the fact that you basically assume that where these uh, organisms grow and develop doesn't matter for the purposes of this modeling. So, you know, certain the, kind of, the phenomena you're looking for is going to be more or less unchanged independently of the environment. And pragmatic conditions, uh, conditions of access to the organism, adaptability, things like this. Now, so the crucial assumption again that, that we're really interested in here is how do we think that these properties of the model, which are single type by the researchers, such as the fact that it has conserved evolutionary pathways, can actually legitimately be attributed to the target. Partly also because there's been a huge debate in philosophy of biology about, about this being hardly the case, or at least this being potentially very contentious. And, and you can imagine why. I mean, why would I want to assume that a genetic, say, a particular genetic trait or a developmental pathway that I found in a little plant can be thought of as the same as the genetic pathway that I find in humans, for instance, which is an assumption which is very often made. So, what makes this commitment possible is this key that allows the comparison of the properties of the model, the properties of the target. And I think that's also where the DECI account has been helpful for us because it, help, it helps to avoid the confusion that arises, particularly in relation to model organisms, where you know, there is a confusion between what actually works as the model and what is in fact being represented. I mean, some people just think it's just exactly the same. We don't think so. I mean, and I think that this um, way of thinking about representation is very helpful in that way. Now, as I said, the question we are very interested in is what makes these models into plausible representations? And this is where we start to think about skills in a very, very uh, big sense. Because this depends on the degree to which the researchers deem the use of these organisms as models for given phenomena to actually be epistemically fruitful and justifiable within the research environment and within possibly a broader research environment. So this notion of plausibility we're thinking about here is necessarily a dynamic notion. It's a notion that encompasses a whole spectrum that can vary from low plausibility to high plausibility and can evolve and iterate as the practices that uh, researchers use to interact with these organisms and to produce knowledge from them themselves uh, change. And of course, the conceptual underpinnings also change. So the way we want to think about plausibility broadly is the degree to which researchers deem the use of a specimen as a model for a given phenomenon or a group of organisms to be acceptable to their peers, to fit within a certain kind of epistemic space and system of practice. And here I'm thinking about the work of Azio Renberger and, and Azok um, in defining this. And in fact, makes it possible for researchers to rationalize and justify the commitment they're making in adopting this model uh, to other researchers, which also is very much part of the enterprise of adopting and justifying methodologically the use of uh, model organisms in research. So uh, one of the things that uh, for us was very interesting is to see uh, Roman and James producing this kind of daily account and thinking, you know, one of the things that they really wanted to explore was the idea that, well, researchers, at least in principle, are free to choose which key would make the choice of the model plausible, which would make the you know, kind of correspondence between the properties of the model and the properties of the target. Plausible. And of course, our first reaction to that would be to say, well, I mean, as soon as we start to think about the cases we are interested in, freedom evaporates in a cloud of smoke extremely quickly because we have a situation which is incredibly constrained. And the interesting thing then becomes how do we define that set of constraints and how does that relate to Hank's concern with the kind of skills that people need to be able to exercise for the use of this kind of model to actually provide a good understanding and for this to be something which is legitimately accepted within research. So in our case, <coughs> the choice of the key is clearly constrained by you know, some physical features of the model, whether or not they have a particular genetic cluster, for instance. But it also, and crucially, and sometimes in a sense it is overwritten, these, these features are overwritten, by um, consideration of the habits and the assumptions that are built into the communities that use these models over, in fact, decades of work. And so what we've been arguing uh, in the last few years is that reliance on model organisms as plausible models depends crucially 
on the association of these models with what we call a repertoire, which we see as a particular way of doing science, which has very many components which go well beyond conceptual and theoretical components. They involve performative components, they involve very particular sets of skills, and they involve the material, social, and infrastructural resources to be able to exercise those skills and manipulate models in a particular way. So we define repertoires as well-aligned assemblages of the skills, behaviors, and material, social, and epistemic components that group may, groups may use to practice and manage certain kinds of science and train newcomers, again, very important, the skills here, and whose enactment affects the methods and results of research. So if you want a representation of a repertoire, which, you know, of course, can, looks like a big blur, but at least kind of gives you a few of the elements uh, which are part of this, this is a situation where you have particular ways of doing science, where people really have thought through all of these elements, pretty much. How they would fit together, in which constellation, how would people uh, could take advantage of the intersection between these different resources to uh, be able to put certain models to work and to acquire understanding. And this would include many things that have strong relationship with how we actually learn to perform certain activities, how do we actually become a certain kind of agent, from the use of particular technologies, about how to work in data infrastructures, for instance, from the community skills that you actually acquire by being in a very particular social environment, the communication strategies you want to use, and the social goals you are committed to, uh, the standards you're adopting, which again typically require a lot of training for you to be able to really manipulate it well during your work. So I want to define a model organism repertoire as allowing uh, research communities, if you want to persist beyond a certain specific project, I mean these are you know, communities that are actually you know, uh, present all over the world very often, these are uh, reproduced a bit all over the place in very similar ways. And this is because they adopt a uh, similar strains, so they actually have ways to standardize uh, the organisms, the specimens, in which are very similar. They produce them, they use them, disseminate them mm -hmm. uh, also in, in, in which are compatible, and there's a whole set of apparatus which allows them to do this. They produce and very often try to articulate explicitly as much as possible the know-how that relates to the use of these organisms, uh, the expertise related to that, the protocols that one would use in experimenting with them, the instrumentation that needs to be uh, used, and uh, critically, of course, the fact that you want to then be able to produce data that can be circulated and can be made comparable by reliance on the standards and the skills exercised. And um, then share a certain ethos, for instance, of sharing data and sharing certain techniques prior to publication. Uh, they include the establishment uh, of infrastructures as the stock centers, which allow you to actually uh, uh, produce and disseminate the strains. Um, the concept of model organism actually becomes in itself something that is modelized also politically and, and socially and administratively uh, within this kinds of uh, way of doing research, and is typically attached to longer term blue skies type of funding. Um, so one can think about, and we've done so work in um, analyzing what the components of this model organism repertoire really would be. I'm not going to get obviously into the details of this now, but just to say there are many of the characteristics that we attribute to the organisms themselves, so if you want to the actual material model here, which would range from things that these organisms exhibit in the wild, whatever that may mean, but you know, things like you know, the length of the life cycle, for instance, um, or their size or the size of the genome, but also would include things which have been induced, properties which have been induced in the organism by uh, experimental manipulation and standardization. And also properties that actually have been attributed to the organism without necessarily being something that you can really find in it in any obvious sense. Um, but interestingly, they also, this repertoire also includes many characteristics of the communities that are working with these models. So some of them would be certain kind of conceptual commitments, and then there would be a big debate about what we think about those in terms of theories and how do we associate that with the notion of theory. But things like evolutionary conservation, the idea that we're focusing on organisms in isolation from the environment, the idea that we're actually trying to understand an organism by doing inter-level organization analysis, so we want to relate, say, genetic traits, <coughs> environmental traits, physiological traits, and um, morphological traits. And things like that, and down to things like institutional organization that actually is really characterized the history of, of these um, communities over quite a long while. And of course, there's also some characteristics of the broader landscape in which the research takes place. 
which for instance, for modern organisms, has been a particular attachment to a molecular view of life, which has been amply documented within uh, the history of biology, the history of science, but has certainly made it much more plausible to work on organisms in this particular way over the last 50 years. And in fact, because now this is shifting, this work is also interestingly shifting. So, modern organism research we take to be a very good example of a repertoire which includes specific material, social, and epistemic conditions under which individuals join together to perform projects and achieve common goals, and they do that in a robust way over time, despite changes in the global landscape. And this actually involves adopting an increasing entrenchment to specific theoretical commitments, such as the assumption of evolution conservation and present integrity growth level capitalism. Now, what does it mean for something like you know, our, our own interpretation of the Aki model in the case of um, the plausibility of model organisms as well? Well, it means that in fact, what we are calling a repertoire is what um, I think, or what we think, uh, James and Roman in fact are calling the So to really understand, which has all sorts of implications, like you start to see where social epistemology enters like in a big way in <coughs> our reason around what makes a modern representation implausible. Like it certainly we think happens here. We have in other places, but certainly here. This is what makes um, the comparison between properties of the model and properties of the target plausible. And it's obviously, in the case of modern organisms, a very complicated apparatus. It doesn't have to be the case all the time. But in this case, because the model was so implausible to start with, that's what we basically end up with uh, in terms of trying to ground this. And I think we sort of um, verified, at least we think, uh, they also empirically, like the plausibility of our own modeling of this situation. We just uh, produced a big analysis together with uh, Mike Dietrich, Sarah Green, and Nathan Crow of just looking at scientific literature, what scientists cite as reasons for organism choice. And in fact, that includes pretty much all of the elements that we associate with the repertoire. Now, coming to understanding. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, it's taken a while, but I hope that you sort of see why I wanted to get into this case in a little bit more detail. So, I mean, I think it's absolutely no coincidence that this work comes straight from me, like in many ways being like a PhD student with Hank. And it certainly is a view that really has allowed me to develop this work and underpin this work in many, many different ways. And so just to go back to um, some of the things we already have said about uh, Hank's views, I'm not going to really spend much time on this, but you know, picking up again on this distinction between uh, understanding a phenomenon, having an adequate explanation of this phenomenon, which actually also refers to explanatory understanding, and understanding a theory, being able to use that theory, which he refers to as the pragmatic understanding in the book. Now, the core of his view is that understanding theory, defined as pragmatic understanding, is necessary, but it's actually not sufficient for understanding a phenomenon defined in those terms. Now, what do we think uh, when we're uh, considering the case that I've been proposing? Well, understanding of a theory is necessary for understanding a phenomenon. Absolutely. If, of course, we take the notion of theory to encompass a quite a wide variety of levels of formalization. So certainly when you want to think about what's going on in biology, um, you want to think about what actually is uh, capturing theory and theoretical commitments here. So I think in the case that I've illustrated, there's, very different element, there's many elements of conceptual commitments in the story I've been telling. I mean, whether or not they would be always recognized in philosophy science as being a theory, maybe it's, it's a different question, but I think if you interpret the um, disclose in this way, then this works. And the idea that the understanding of theory is not sufficient for understanding phenomena, yes. And, and I think what this illustrates, hopefully, quite nicely, is the idea that understanding via the choice and the use of a plausible model does, in fact, typically, and certainly in this case, involve much more than conceptual commitments and theoretical knowledge. It involves what I prefer to uh, refer to as performative skills and social skills. So, Providing a capacity for understanding here involves you know, these broad categories that we can have a long discussion about, but you know, we can refer to as embodied knowledge, so we refer to as tacit knowledge, and also social knowledge, understanding of the social environment in which you're actually carrying out the research. And, um, and I think this hopefully will keep recurring today as a theme and certainly in, in, uh, um, in Azok's uh, talk later on. So what I've been trying to propose is the study of repertoire <coughs> as a way to try and improve the understanding of how the use of models enables researchers to intertwine social, embodied, and propositional and theoretical knowledge to achieve understanding. Thank you very much. <laughs>